so this is an important article that's in its developmental stages at the moment. It's about the discussion of extending human rights. This discussion has been taken a, a while ago, and it has gotten prominence in the in, in academia around the 60s and then in the 80s with Peter Singer, which is a philosopher. He came up initially with the, the book uh, Animal Liberation, when where he talked about all, all of the inconsistencies in animals being legal, not being a legal entity and humans being legal entities and all, all of the bad consequences it, it causes to animals and how they experience it. So it then got into a plateau because it was considered to be too complex to actually implement animal rights uh, because it comes the question that they wouldn't they would not be able to have duties as they they wouldn't follow our social norms. So the discussion didn't move forward, although philosophically it still was discussed, but in terms of the legal discussion and actually finding a framework to give them more rights, mm -hmm. it has ca kind of got off the agenda. They now talk more about animal well-being, uh, which is more about mitigating suffering than actually giving them rights to have a flourishing life. So uh, I, in this research, explored the concept of agenda setting because the question this research proposes is that there might be uh, an agenda issue for animals' rights to not go through in, a, in an actual mainstream public discussion. The agenda setting concept is that the agenda doesn't determine what to think about. Instead, it determines what we will talk about. And when they get the public to talk about a certain issue, then it, it goes in its own direction. So in the case of animal rights, the discussion has not even gone through the screen of being discussed by the white public. So it's not something that is scared about. There are so many other issues that are considered to be priority as animal rights are always in the shadows of philosophical discussions of very specific people. So I will come a little bit into the counter arguments that are proposed, but before it, I, I want to explain a little bit why I consider that if animal rights go in a wide public discussion, it will probably lead to a change in legal frameworks and perception. Because when we think about why humans have rights, there is probably a intuitive idea uh, that, that's being created in ourselves as we've been educated, that there's a big difference between humans and animals, and there's a border. But when we look at it scientifically, this border is not that clear, and there are bigger borders in the animal world between one species to another than in humans to other species. And it looks like that we're so different because we have this way of life and we talk about ourselves, our future, we have plans and all these kind of things of society. We've gone to space. We are here discussing. There was screened in a computer uh, about legal issues and we have all these moral frameworks. But these special things of being human that look like we do it because we are human are not intrinsic to the condition of being human. You can be a human being and not do any of these special things and not use the internet, not have 
perception of future or anything else. This happens to human because of cultural knowledge. And we look to be, although we can find cultural knowledge in other species, we look to be a species capable of cooperating in a larger scale than most animals. So nowadays with this globalized world, we can say that we have more, more than a billion, billion people cooperating in some specific goals. And we don't get animals to do that. And this leads to knowledge upon knowledge. So I was born in 1997 and everything I learned was learned in centuries before me. And it was building up one after another. So it doesn't happen to animals, but we can, we can, we have to pay attention that these things are not intrinsic to the condition of being human. And that is where the contradiction comes up because human rights are for the condition of being human. And what is it that we have that is unique to humans that animals don't have that is all about the condition of being human? So for that, I would propose the exercise of us imagining an imaginary island where humans are born like community of 50 people and they don't have any previous knowledge there's no lineage of humans before them how would they live how would they live their lives it wouldn't be anything like the way we live right now it would be more, but probably much more like nape live their lives they would ar arrange in communities they would have different social structures they wouldn't have a legal uh, legality in the way they 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 act and can conduct them themselves. They would probably fight a lot. Anyway, so these are the behavior that is that would be so-called the natural behavior of being a human. But we've warped this behavior because of cultural knowledge. And that's commendable. I have no problem with it. But that is where I come to the ex exclusionary focus and species that animals and humans are much alike. And I will come to the religious and philosophical foundations for that, because we have had different relationship with animals. So this perception of humans above and all animals coming up to serve humans are biblical references. And it's this perception that humans were made in the image of God and all of the other animals are servers for humans. This is not a scientific fact and it wasn't thought to be like that from different cultures. And if you look to indigenous communities, some of them will have a totally different relationship with some animals and some other species. Uh, some will show more respect and reciprocity in their relationship and admiration and curiosity about the way of lives. But we have come to a position of considering that we are ourselves at the top and we can exploit animals the way we want. So when I come back to the agenda phenomenon, the criticism I'm trying to pose is that for an agenda to materialize and for a topic to be discussed by the wide public, there might be interest of big stakeholders for us to discuss it. And I don't think there is interest of big stakeholders for animal rights to go through because many of our society is predicated on the exploitation of animals. And stakeholders would be harmed by giving rights. Rights of having a free land, of having spaces, and go on in their characteristic form of life. So as this economic interest lacks the discussion is sidelined to the 
philosophical and small uh, small discussions in academia. The people who discuss animal rights try to discuss how will this animal rights be implemented. And I'm not here to talk about implementation because before implementation and finding the legality for it, I consider that we should get the discussion to the wider public. The discussion on who they are, how they experience the world, what what is the perspective, do they have consciousness? And we have substantial scientific knowledge and observations on how they experience the world and their perspective of, of the world and how, how they suffer and how much we impede them to, of having a flourishing life. As an example, I would show the poultry industry that they have around 33 billion chickens living right now and their life expectancy is of three months. So it, it's literally a good. They've been totally com commodified. And if they had any rights, it, it would in it wouldn't be possible or not even imagined imagined. So I imagine that the stakeholders that control the industry wouldn't want this discussion to come to the public. So I propose that we consider that uh, are we not discussing animal rights because we as persons don't consider they should have rights or are we not discussing it because there's no external force determining what to think? We would come up to the conclusion that the way it is right now is not good. And then when we have most of the people who are concerned of in decision making, not satisfied with the way we treat animals and they are seen in society, it will necessarily come to a change. And then I'm happy to discuss how to implement animal rights and which rights for which animals, because at the moment we don't even consider it. Some people consider it, but not to the level it needs to be to provoke change. I want to talk about a, a little bit a bit about how to implement it, which in, in terms of legality, because the, the problem in the in the discussion is that people propose it in different ways. So when when I first said that P Peter Singer was the first to, to come up with the idea and try to bring it to the mainstream discussion, he was an utilitarian so he considered that suffering and pleasure were the important things and he, his goal was to di diminish all types of suffering in the world for all, all beings that do have suffering at different levels and increase the amount of pleasure so some other scholars have thought this to be too, too simplistic that different forms of lives have different objective and different perceptions perceptions of reality and different point of views of the world and that point is to allow their forms of life to flourish which is legitimate and stephen wise which is a lawyer in 2001 came up with the, the book rattling the cage where he proposed uh, an actual framework of changing. So the world is mainly divided in two types of legal frameworks, which is civil law and common law. Civil law is followed by most countries and is more based on legal scripture. So the law that is written in a paper that they follow. And Common law is more based on precedent. So judges decide and other other judges, when they find a case similar to, to this case, they will base their judgment on this previ previous decision. So as we might imagine, the common law is more adaptable to change of social perceptions. 
and the proposal of Stephen Wise, which I agree with, is that we we should pursue it through the common law, and th this is why I propose generally that apes should be the first ones for us to reclaim their rights because it's easier to prove that they have their intrinsic life much similar to how humans have their lives intrinsically. So these intrinsic characteristics are similar and it's easier to show it to a judge and to get them to make a decision considering their legal personhood. So that, that's the only reason why I consider that we should talk about apes first. I don't think there is a hierarchy between different forms of life. There are just forms of life that are legitimate to flourish in the way they were, they strive to flourish. So this is where I make a call for, we reflect and think about who we are excluding. And I get uncomfortable when thinking about the amount of suffering we legally inflict in the world, because some people will come with the argument that why, why are you thinking about animal rights? if we don't even get human rights to be actually implemented. I don't think one discussion gets in the way of the, the other. And my thing with the animal rights is that all the appalling be behavior that we have towards the animals are legal. So we don't even have a way of defending them. Whereas human rights, it shouldn't happen legally. So it's there is a pathway. So I'm trying to build a pathway. And I think that if most people got into it, they would want to build this pathway as well. So that's pretty much it.